you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. And here we are, everyday innovators. We are friends, so I can tell you something, right? All right, I'm excited because I just saw the final print of my book from my publisher. I am so grateful and excited to release this book on innovation to the world, to you. It's all about how you ignite innovation to stay relevant and gain the advantage and win. I know it's not officially out until May, but I just had to share. I'm so excited. Oh, and the book is called Innovation is Everybody's Business. And that includes you, the listener of this podcast. I'm so excited. All right. And innovation is exactly what we're talking about today. Actually, scratch that. Today is about disruption. So today's guest, Charlene Lee, has a little bit of a different bent on disruption and the role that it plays within innovation and growth. And she spent decades helping companies grow. What I think you'll find most valuable in this interview is, like I said, Charlene's view that disruption doesn't create growth. It's the opposite. Growth creates disruption. That is a powerful distinction, especially when you think about your job and innovation and the impact of moving that innovation forward. So for the past few decades, Charlene has been helping people see the future. She's an expert on digital transformation, leadership, customer experience, and the future of work. She is the author of six books, including the New York Times bestseller, Open Leadership, and co-author of the critically acclaimed book, Groundswell. Her latest book is the bestseller, The Disruption Mindset. She's the founder and senior fellow at Altimeter, a disruptive analyst firm acquired in 2015 by Profit. She's named one of the most creative people in business by Fast Company. Yeah, I think that's kind of a big deal. And she's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Business School. All right, a lot of credentials there. I think you're going to find this interview fascinating. What I really appreciate about Charlene in this interview is that she really explains the how and the why behind it and gives a lot of case studies to bring this elusive word disruption to life in a, in a bit of a different, more tangible way. All right, let's do this. Charlene, thank you so much for joining me today. I just, I cannot wait to dig into this topic. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, me too. So since our first time meeting, tell me what's the one thing people would be surprised to learn about you? I'm kind of an adventure junkie. Uh, So I um, recently went skydiving and last weekend I took a fire eating class. So yeah, I kind of like doing these different things that push me out of my comfort zone. Okay. So I got to know, because I'm all about new experiences, trying new things. I just tried Bikram yoga for the first time. So tell me about fire eating. Just was it scary? Does it hurt the mouth or is like, just just give me the lowdown. I got to know. um, I, it was a great class if you ever want to take it. It's at the Crucible in Oakland, California. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's kind of like eating. If, if you're, it, it doesn't hurt at all. And um, you just have to be a little bit careful. The hardest thing is when you put, you light your tongue and you light another torch with the tongue. Um, and then it feels a little bit like eating a little bit of hot soup. Oh, so hot soup. It. Okay. Good to know. By the way, I'm originally from Oakland, so we'll have that discussion later because that's my favorite place in the world. Go Raiders. Different. That's not what we're here to discuss today. But I feel like your adventure seeking kind of falls in line with what you do with innovation and disruption. But let's let's start at a kind of higher level because I think both of those words are words that people use freely and differently. So, f- from your perspective, what's the difference between innovation and disruption? Well, innovation, I think, is trying to find new things, new ideas. Um, but and oftentimes organizations in particular want innovation to stay safe, predictable, understandable, a, a clear return on investment on innovation. But when we're talking about disruption, we're usually talking about changing the status quo to make it better. And there's a promise that it is not going to be easy. And so I think innovation in some ways is a false promise of progress. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll do innovation only if it doesn't disrupt. Whereas disruption goes, oh, no, we're going to grow and it's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. 
Let me ask you a question about disruption because I think, you know, it's one of those things where I'll, I'll often get calls from clients and they'll say, we, we need to disrupt or shake up the industry. Um, and it seems oftentimes that a disruption, it less starts from that place and more starts from a place of there's this need or this new way of doing things that we think can make an impact. You know, it's almost like, you, you hear it when, when you interview people who have a blockbuster movie, they always went in saying, we just loved what we were doing versus, you know, a movie that is meant to be a blockbuster from the gate and it f- tends to fail. I mean, it was just this weekend, right? Star Wars and Cats came out and Cats bombed and it felt like they started with, we're going to disrupt. So how do you think about that? Because I, I often feel that disruption happens but it's not necessarily the first goal when you start down the path. I so agree with that. I mean, I've been an analyst now for 20 years and I get tons of briefings. I've listened to thousands of briefings from people and I can usually tell within five minutes if they're going to get, get any traction at all. And, and it's because they talk about that problem. They talk about this need that they're going to uh, fill. Whereas other people are saying, we're going to disrupt the X industry. I'm like, no, no, right. you don't disrupt an industry. You fill the need. Right. And that filling the need and that growth that comes from it is the thing that disrupts everything. I, I not laugh, but I, but I always chuckle a little bit when people come to me and say, we're, we're going to just, you know, shake things up and transform. And, but, but to your point, it seems like what's often missing is really fulfilling the need or figuring out a new method. Like I know everybody uses Uber. It's such an obvi- obvious example, but you know, he was really trying to fulfill a need that he had started. And then that kind of grew and transpired from there versus I'm going to go shake up taxis. No, that was not their intention at all. Their yeah. intention wasn't <laughs> to go like create, you know, disrupt transportation. They just wanted to get a ride to the airport. Right. Totally. No. Right. I mean, Paris, right. Where he's like, all these people are driving by and I just need a ride. <laughs> and so I, I kind of go like, it was sort of obvious in some ways. And, and again, the thing about Uber is that they didn't use any new technology. Right. They, they identified a problem and then used technology, existing technology that anybody else had access to. Anybody could have built Uber, but they built Uber. They're the ones who put it together, solved that need, and do, stuck with it. Do you think that the um, drive to or the propensity to latch on to the latest and greatest technology or like, you know, system of the day, whatever it is, the, the shiny ball of the day gets in the way of innovation and disruption or does it help Absolutely. it? I mean, I've seen so many yeah. launched, um, you know, pitch decks that say, well, you, you need to have blockchain AI. And if you could throw right. in there too as well, yeah, throw quantum in there. Right, right. right. Totally. Like, no, 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 no. What is the problem that you're solving? How, what is that need? And, and I also hear this other mistake. I hear from entrepreneurs, just follow your passion. I'm like, no, 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 because your passion probably isn't somebody else's need. Right. I, I look at it this way. Go and follow a busy parent around for a day, preferably a mom, and see all the problems they encounter. You solve some of those problems, you have a billion-dollar business. Because there are lots of moms. There are lots of busy people. You solve their problems, start with that. And it's really boring stuff. That um, that that we can solve that it could make people's lives so much better. You know, I think there's a Charlene another thing that you said in there that's uh, extremely important, which is your problem or passion may not be everybody else's. So validate that what you're trying to solve is something that other people want you to solve too. Right. A, a friend of mine who started a very successful business went through and just made a list of all these problems, and then did research on which of those problems would be a viable business. And then started that business. Hmm. It was nothing about her passion because she was the things that I'm passionate about don't make money. <laughs> so not really people's problems. You mean fire, fire, fire eating passion. does not solve problems? No, that- no it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, and, and so while well, it'd be really cool and it's really fun and I'm passionate about it. I mean, when you're creating a business, when you're launching something, it is a hard slog. Yeah, And the thing about passions is I want to keep it fun. I want to keep it enjoyable. And what I can be excited about and passionate about work is when I can see a problem being solved and we're making progress, we're, we're addressing that problem and we're seeing an impact on people's lives. That should be the driving force. In your experience, 
how do you validate that a problem is worth solving? And whether that is, I guess I want to tackle it from two perspectives. One is from the internal perspective, meaning, you know, maybe it's how you're doing business, the systems or processes that you're using. Because we all have, I think, in our days, that thing that we're like, oh, why do I have to input that form 10 times? But we do it and we move on. But but that's one part. And then the other part is obviously in the marketplace. How do you think about making sure that like, yeah, this is where we should focus our time? I mean, this is, this is research and in the end, um, good guts. I, again, VCs are constantly asking, you know, how big is this addressable market? And if there was an addressable market for you to go after, everybody else would be going after it. Mm. It's finding that unaddressed need, that potential addressable market, and then making a case for why you could develop that or help people understand that unmet narrative and unmet need. I, 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 the example I opened my book with is T-Mobile. I mean, fourth... Um, distant fourth player in the U.S. mobile market. And what they did is they realized that everybody else was selling on coverage and pricing of the packages. Nobody was saying, we're here for you, the customer. So they became the uncarrier. It changed everything they did in the company uh, to say, we're going to meet this unmet need that customers say, I want to be seen and heard. It's a really simple idea, but they became extremely customer focused. I love that that example in your book that you opened up with that because I think it also highlights that they found the, the they found a competitive advantage that the other ones going on price and ca- I think carriers you said it um, couldn't mimic overnight either. Right, and they eventually all got rid of contracts, for example, which is the big thing at T-Mobile. They just tore up all the contracts and said, "Hey, come over. You're not going to be tied in for two years. If you don't like us, if we're not doing a job, shame on us." It's not your problem. It's our problem. And, and people are just like, whoa, that's great. <laughs> right. I'm, leaving. I'm leaving AT&T and Verizon and Sprint. I'm, I'm going to run over to T-Mobile. I think that's part of the reason why we work, you know, the, the collaboration workspace um, was so successful to begin with. I know they've run into some hot water for some other reasons now, but if you look at their massive growth, I think for this kind of unmet need and all these small entrepreneurs working in cafes across the globe, um, you know, we didn't, nobody wanted six month, a year long conference, like every other, you know, kind of rentable office space. And they came in, I was like, nah, go month to month, have a desk, have an office, have some coffee, whatever. And I think that's part of the, to your kind of your point about disruption, that's part of how they did that was finding that place that other people weren't playing. Right. Exactly. I, I, again, we work has so many other issues, but you don't even get an office in some cases that we work. No. You just get a spot at a community table. I mean, you just get to come and, and hope there's a table available, really. Right. And you know what? That's that's fine. That's all I yeah. need. I just need to get out of my house with all of my other roommates right. and my kids <laughs> and my dog and chaos. And my laundry and my dishes. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things that you write about, and I'd love for you to explain a little bit further, is that because I think we often have it flipped. You said that disruption doesn't create growth, but that growth creates disruption. Will you talk a little more about what you mean by that? Yeah, this is the linchpin of the book. Uh, People constantly ask, so what's the thing that we can do, the disruptive technology or the disruptive innovation to drive growth? And the reality is, is that many organizations know already what they need to grow. I I go around and ask people, if you could grow to X, what would you do differently? And almost every single person goes, I know exactly what I would do to grow twice as much next year as I did this year. And they don't do it because doing that would be incredibly disruptive. Mm. So I, I'm like, look, get out of your own way. Um, I, there, there was a, a conversation I put at the end of the book um, with Larry Page and Eric Smith. And Eric asked Larry Page, what's the biggest thing, that biggest threat to Google? And Larry goes, Google, it's ourselves. We don't get out of our own way. We doubt ourselves. We um, double guess. We, we don't move fast enough. We put all these unnecessary processes and checks in place when we should go, be going out there into the marketplace as quickly as possible to try to understand what our customers want. And, and that, is, that is the biggest thing. So it's growth that is disruptive. And we step away from it because of the huge implications of what it means, the discomfort, um, the risk that it would mean. So that's interesting to me because on the flip side, right, um, decline in sales, decline in growth, just straight up decline also creates disruption in a different way. And it it seems like part of our challenge on both sides is that we are trying to keep homeostasis. 
you know, we're trying to stay where, how we're doing things now. Have you seen a really good example of someone that's tackled growth and the disruption that it creates in a way that's helped them manage it or ease through it? Yeah, I, I think ING Bank is a great example. I put them towards the end of the book. And um, one of the things they did is they were coming out of financial crisis, uh, not in a good place. And so they say, like, how do we make sure that we grow? Uh, and so they said, we're going to cost cut, but we're going to cost cut and disrupt and reorganize ourselves into a completely agile organization because this is the time when we need to make that investment for growth in the future. So as they were going down in terms of their revenues and profits, they were investing in order to grow into the future. And instead of just cutting costs, they were taking those costs to make those investments. That was the key thing. They weren't mm-hmm. necessarily just cutting the costs to make some numbers on a quarterly basis. They were doing it so that they could conserve that cash and invest it into disruptive growth moves. I hope that all of us are launching are really paying attention to this idea because I, I hadn't really kind of framed it in the way, Charlene, that you are about this growth creates disruption. And I think part of that is, a, is about kind of the example you just gave, which is also about managing expectations. I think to your point, we don't realize that when we're successful, it also means disruption in how we do things and having to think about that ahead of time and not after the fact where, I don't know if this damage is done, but we're, we're in reactive mode to the growth versus helping foster it along. Yeah. I, I think again, as a startup or a small company, your biggest advantage, frankly, is that you don't have any existing customers. And the reason why that's such an advantage yeah. is that you're not blinded by these beautiful, profitable customers. Whereas if you're an incumbent and established business, what do you do? Serve your customers really well, especially your best customers. And the mistake here is, of course, you should do that. But realizing that your best customers today may or may not be your best customers in the future. Well, and I think to your point, it's this, and I hear this all the time with people, it's this balancing act between steering the ship that's working and trying to kind of chart a new path at the same time. So to your point, right, you don't want to lose the people who are paying the bills and paying them well and then try to go after it's hard to balance both in your everyday work. Well, guess what? I, I, um, I, I love that analogy, but when I was on an aircraft carrier, uh, one yep. of the things I was very much struck by is that it was a constant work of improvement and disruption mm. on that ship. They would throw disruptions at the ship, operations, maintenance, stress the materials, try out new things constantly. So while they were aiming for excellence in their everyday routines, they also were saying, like, what could our enemy do? What are the circumstances? Mm, that's that a great example. Us so that we know we're resilient against that. And they were literally taking these physical ways to catapult and throw the airplane off. They literally, they, they <laughs> catapult a plane off the front of the ship. It's a mechanical system. And they were moving that to a magnetic system because it takes up a lot less energy. It's much more reliable, but it, it was kind of funky, right? So literally, this, you can't take your launch system offline because that's the thing that protects you the most is your air power. So how do you literally shift this over in, in, in an entire fleet and, and um, make sure that it works? Well, and I think we undervalue the power of small experiments, which is a little bit what I hear you saying is, so yes, there's day-to-day operational excellence, but they're also doing all these little tests all day long to figure out where to improve, change, modify, innovate at the same time. But those don't have to be, let's scrap it all and do it all right away. Let's test all these little things and learn and change as we go. What I found is that the most disruptive companies don't actually do big, huge changes. They do a lot of small changes really, really quickly. So it looks like to us on the outside, like they just did this huge launch. And in fact, they were working on it for three years. We just didn't right. know about it. It's the tip of the iceberg effect, right? Yeah. We only and, see a small portion of it. And when you do lots of experiments constantly all the time, you grow your competence and your confidence at being able to disrupt yourself. Um, so in your book, The Disruption Mindset, and we'll put a link in the show notes, I, I want to dig into this because I thought this part was so fascinating. You cover what you call the three elements of disruption. So what I'd love to do is to go into depth on those and have you share some examples. So the first one is the future customers to make big gulp decisions. Will you talk about that? Sure. Again, I talked a little bit about with T-Mobile, how yeah. they focus on this future customer need. But the example I love to give here is Adobe. When they decided to move from packaged software for their creative suite 
Photoshop, Illustrator, all those great products, move those into the cloud. Nobody was actually asking for this. The customers were perfectly happy with a perpetual license that they could buy. And so they were like, but this is the right thing to do because the experience would be so much better. We can do product launches. We would know more about how people were using the products, et cetera. And there was also another problem that they knew their financials would go down for two years. Their top line and their bottom line in particular would take a hit for two years as they worked through this shift. And they decided to do it. So they went, it's not, talk about setting expectations. They went to Wall Street and say, I've got great news. We're going to pivot the company, lose money for two years. I mean, literally, but they, they were able to do it. And then literally when the price, when they're, they came every quarter and announced you know, declining earnings, their stock price would go up because <laughs> they could show that declining earnings meant that their business plan was working. People were stopping buying uh, the package software and buying more in the cloud. So while the revenues are going down, the subscription numbers are going up, but they wouldn't see the impact of that for another two years. So they were able to tell that story in a very successful way. And the company has been thriving. Their revenues and stock prices are up like seven and 10 times. And, but it, it, it was this huge, big gulp decision to do that when you're betting two thirds of the company, a $2 billion bet that this was going to work. What do you think it takes to be willing to do that big gulp decision? Because to exactly what you said earlier, it's very hard to let go of that revenue and they were willing to do that. And, and I love the, what you were saying about the correlation between declining revenues and actually hitting their targets. I think that's a really important tie to create. But I, j just from like a start perspective, how do, you, how do you get people to be willing to even do that? I, again, it, it is, it is this is focused on the future customers. They were completely aligned as an executive team on this model of who that future customer was and what their needs were. And it was just this like um, laser focus. I mean, they never took their eye off that ball. Never. Despite customers' complaints, employees being um, just in an uproar about it, and, and even Wall Street like, are you crazy? Uh, so they just like, this is absolutely the right thing to do. And they kept telling the story about who that future customer was, their vision of that, sharing it over and over and over again. They never deviated from that. And they did research too. They did a little research project in Australia to, to test this to see if it worked. And it gave them enough confidence that, yeah, we think it'll work. Um, let's test it and see, like in the marketplace. Uh, but the interesting thing is they didn't pull back completely from package. They ran the two side by side for about a year, year and a half. And then they finally pulled the plug on the package software and said, we're only doing cloud. I'm assuming so, that's once they saw success on the other side. Yeah, exactly. I love the idea of doing an exercise or maybe even continually doing an exercise of defining your future customer. I think we spend so much time defining our current customer and labeling them and kind of segmenting them, uh, which is great for today. But I think to everything that you're saying, that doesn't tell us decisions that are going to help us make decisions that are going to impact tomorrow. Right. And, and look at it this way. If all the work you're doing is to meet the customer needs of today, that's great. But by the time you implement them, even right. if it's three months or six months later, they're three or six months down the road and you're just playing catch up to them. I think a much better thing to do is to figure out who your future customers are going to be and make the investments today to will meet them. I absolutely keep executing on meeting the needs of the customers today, but in all your planning and development, everything should be focused on your future customer. And, you know, it's funny. It's reminded me of all the market research I used to do in new product development. And a lot of it was in food, but we would show these rough concepts to customers and say, you know, would you buy this? And there's all these other group think issues that go along with focus groups. But I always in the back of my head thought, this is ridiculous. They're, we're asking them to answer yesterday's problem for them. They can't tell us tomorrow's problem. That's not their job. They can't think to a year ahead, but we're actually solving, not only are we solving yesterday's problem, but we're also not taking it, it the opportunity into the future. And by the time we get this to the market, that, that trend is going to be long gone. And it, I'd see it happen over and over again. Yeah. And the other thing I hear is that, well, you know, we're, we're not going to be a fast, you know, first leader. We're not going to be innovative. We're just going to be a fast follower. We're going to watch and see what competitors do and then mm. and, and do the things right. that really well. Well, guess what? They're behind and you're behind now. And, and this is not honoring who your customers are. I mean, if you're going to dictate what you do in the marketplace based on your competition versus who you think your customers are, that's a complete cop-out. Yeah. 
I like the way you said that. It was very tough love. That's a cop out. <laughs> I like that. Um, let's talk about the second of the three elements, which is leadership that creates a movement of disruptors. Yeah, again, disruption is very, very hard. It is, it is gut-wrenching and it's fatiguing. And it requires a different type of leader. A, a different, a, a, it requires that you show up in a different way. Hmm. Uh, and so we as leaders show up and, we, you know, we lead and oftentimes we're like managing things, making sure things don't blow up and stuff, making things better. But unless you're creating change, I don't think you're a leader because leaders create change. If you're not creating change, you're just a manager. And managing is great, but it's not going to get you to this point of excellence and growth. So if you want to grow, then you're going to have to lead, create change. And frankly, exponential change is hard. So you need to create a movement where people are stepping up themselves and becoming part of that movement and becoming leaders themselves. Because movements run because leaders are inspiring other people to take on that leadership role. And if you want disruption to work, you're going to need a lot of leaders. You can't be the only person at the front doing the cheering and saying, let's go this way. You got to pull people along and have them become leaders too. There's this great TED talk by Derek Sivers. I don't know if you've seen it. I think it's a uh like one of the three minute ones where he talks about the first follower and it's this guy dancing crazy at what looks like a Grateful Dead type concert. And he's all by himself. Right. And it looks like he's crazy and everybody else is normal. And then some guy comes over and starts dancing with them. And that guy then brings five more people and they bring five more. And it's not until those first leaders in this you know concert join him that the movement happened. So when it was just the lone dancer, nothing happened. It was just him being, he looked crazy. And it wasn't until those, to your point, this kind of other disruptors came in and joined him that it became this massive movement. And suddenly the entire, you know, concert is doing these dance moves with this guy. And it kind of, exactly. yeah, it kind of reminds me of what you're saying. My question back to you is, how do you, how do you create that movement of disruptors? Or what are some ways that you've seen really work to make sure that you're not just standing in a podium and trying to inspire or motivate people because that doesn't last, but really create that movement you're talking about. Yeah, I, I think a couple of things. First of all, if you just stand at the podium, wave your hands and say, disrupt or die, and then walk off, <laughs> nothing's going to change. <laughs> Mic <right>? out. <laughs> and um, yes, the, uh, I, find, I did a survey of a thousand leaders all around the world. And I asked them, uh, how disruptive do you think you are? And then a whole bunch of uh, questions about their mindsets and their leadership behaviors to try to figure out what were the correlations between their ability, their perceived ability to drive disruption and what they actually did. And there were two things that came out. One is obviously a, 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 an openness to change mindset. They see change as an opportunity. They're optimistic about the role that change has. They don't fear it. They run towards mm -hmm. it. The other thing is this really interesting leadership behavior, a very specific one, that is you empower and inspire people. And that is the thing about being a leader and creating followership. I do a lot of work around um, uh, describing what followership looks like, um, building on the work from Robert Keller and, and also talking about Derek in that video. Like, What is it that you do? You make it so it's easy for you to follow. You focus on that relationship with that follower where you're treating them almost like an equal. You're bringing them in, right. welcoming them. And your first follower that you identify needs to also become a leader and bring other people with them. So your first follower is extremely important when you're building a movement. When I talk to disruptors and I ask, what was key and essential to you building your um, disruptive idea and your strategy and, and actually making it happen? And they said two things. First of all, they found a great second person mm. who could amplify them, that they could amplify them, made them look great. And in many cases, that was an executive who could provide air cover, provide resources, and bring along every other executive in the company. So it was a really interesting thing that it wasn't just a first follower, but the right first follower. And, and in the book, I have this one quick example that I have um, from a, a nonprofit called SEO. And the, the person who founded it was trying to disrupt inequality um, through education and mentoring. And he couldn't, he was kind of like just going along for about 20 years just on his own, just like kind of small. And then he started an investment banking program and he found like the top titans of Wall Street at Goldman Sachs, at, um, it, it, at these great companies, Merrill Lynch, to come and be the advocates, to be those first followers. And in fact, they became the front face of this and made it take off. So I think it's a definite art to have. 
Do you find too that, um, you know, it's been my experience that those first followers, and you're absolutely right, it needs to be the right people too, but sometimes that's, sometimes it's title based and they have air coverage and resources like you mentioned. And other times I find it's these influencers up and down the organizational ladder that for, for whatever reason, due to personality, their ability to get stuff done, whatever it is, they have sway and they are great to bring along as well. Right. I mean, again, a lot of the tools that we have inside companies, like Outlook, for example, has a tool that can do network analysis that says this is how people are connected to each other. So you can find out who the influencers are, the people most connected. But I think another great way to do this is to find your customer obsessed people. This goes back to how do you find your future customers? You find those people all around the organization. And we know who these people are. They're the ones who complain all the time, like, how come we're not doing this for our customers? What about that? How come we're letting them down? We could do so much more. And you know they're going to be so focused on those future customers. They will just spread this movement about focusing on your future customers up and down throughout the organization if you give them a platform to do that. So this leads into the third element, which is a culture that thrives with disruption. So now you've, we've gone to the future. We've brought a movement of disruptors. Now I'm assuming, right, for sustainability, the culture needs to really allow that to happen. Right. If, if your strategy of focus on future customers shows you this is the roadmap of where we're going, the culture is the engine that drives and determines how fast you go down that, that road. That culture is just made up of two things, beliefs and behaviors. And so if you have beliefs and behaviors that are focused on future customers, oriented towards that, you will be able to thrive with it. And, and organizations come and, and talk to me and say, look, we, have, we don't have a great culture. We, we can't seem to change it. Everyone's just in it for themselves. No one's willing to take risk. And the person who's saying this to me is a CEO. I'm looking at the CEO. This is your company. You can change <laughs> like, that. You might have like, some yeah. accountability to make that happen. <laughs> right. But it's, it really seems daunting. And the problem is, if you don't have a focus for your culture, it is, it's about taking those values, that purpose, that mission, and orienting it towards your future customers. That's the key. Because you can't just float out there and have these, these, these ideas without an anchor. Uh, Peter Drucker has a quote attributed to him that says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It assumes that there's a strategy for you to eat. Mm. Culture needs a strategy to anchor it. Like, what are we trying to do here? And there are three beliefs that I have found consistent across disruptive organizations that are focused on future customers. First of all, they have openness, um, openness of information sharing. The, the decision-making process is fairly transparent. There's a lot of uh, transparency that leads to accountability as a result. The second thing is agency, where people are expected to act like owners. And, uh, and, and this is different from being empowered. Because empowered says, I'm waiting for somebody to tell me I have power. <laughs> Agency says, no, you have it. You have it right from the beginning. Because we know what the strategy is. I hired you to do this job, make the decisions to make sure we align with that strategy. You don't have to keep checking in and ask. Ask if you want to make sure, but you don't need permission to, to go and act. And then third is a bias for action that says, because our future customers are moving quickly away from us, we need to act now. So I, I, I didn't put it in the book, but it's this concept of minimally viable data versus MVP for product. As soon as you have enough data to make a decision of is it going to be A or B, make that decision. You don't wait for it to be perfect because the only way you're going to figure out whether it works or not is to, to act on it. You know, it's, um, I was talking to somebody um, else about this on a different podcast. And I think I shared it at the very, uh, at the very end. I'm not sure actually if we were still recording, but I had said to her, you know, one of the things that I had this boss and I would go in and I'd say, you know, here's kind of what I'm thinking about doing, but I'm not really sure. Like, here's the information. And she'd say, okay, on a scale of one to 10, where are you? And I'd say, well, a six. And she said, great. What data do you, or what information or resources, whatever it is, do you need to get to an eight? Not a 10, not perfect just an eight. And I'd say, oh, well, I, I'm missing these two pieces that would give me the confidence. And she'd say, great, you have you know, a week to go find those two pieces. And then you got to make a decision. And that decision was either yes or no, or you know, this way or that way. But kind of to your point about minimum viable data, getting to my eight was all I really needed. But I, I used to get you know, a little stuck in analysis paralysis, like I think a lot of us do, hoping to get all the data all the time. And that's not really feasible if you, to your point about that third one, want to take action. Yeah. And here's the thing. At what point do you say, I don't need an eight. I, I'm pretty good with six. 
right? Yeah. And what does that number, what does it look like? What is truly minimal? And it's going to vary by organization, by the type of decision and by the person. Yeah. But we might this, very few decisions that you make are irreversible. Very few. Yeah. Well, we're should. not brain surgeons, most of us. So right. it's not and a life or death decision. Well, here's, here's the thing. I was working with a healthcare system and they're like, you know, we can't make mistakes. Our goal here is to have do no harm. That is the model. That is the, the oath that we take. We would do no harm. And I go, well, I think your, your patients, your customers are asking you to make their lives better. And if you are doing an excellent job, but not a perfect job, I think that's what the expectation is. Mm. So uh, when you like that. that mindset of I'm going to be excellent in everything I do, and we're going to talk about the risk. And maybe we not a 10, maybe we do have to be an eight or a nine for these decisions, but sometimes it's six, sometimes it's a three, even in healthcare. But understanding the context of what you're trying to do here, it's not a 10 in every single situation, although especially in healthcare, it may be too late. So I want to bring it back to you for a minute. How do you drive innovation with your team? Or I should say disruption, maybe, either or. <laughs> hey, that was yeah. going to say. Yeah. Um, I, I encourage them to take these risks. Um, I, I, I give them the agency to go and make these decisions. I'm like, this is broadly what we want to do. You know, go do that. But I also expect a lot of openness and communication. Like, just make sure everybody knows what's going on. Um, what doesn't work is when people are off on, off on their own doing something and no one else, else knows what they're doing. Like, what are you doing over there? Why did that email just go out? We didn't know. That came out of left field. Like, what's going on? <laughs> like, I really admire that, that, that get up and do it. But we need to be coordinated on things here. So it's that constant tension, right? How much process do you put in and structure do you put in, but still give people a lot of room to operate? And well, and how, how do you make sure to balance the difference between collaboration and coordination and cons consensus? Because I think consensus kills it kills action. Yeah. Um, but, the, and there's a big difference between the two. I think collaboration is the right people having the right conversations, you know, at the right time to your kind of point about coordination, but making sure that you keep the coordination going without watering down everything. Right. I, I think again, using the collaboration tools that we have available to us, just simple tools like Google docs makes collaboration so much better. Yeah. Very uh, true. It, it allows us to do collaboration on an asynchronous basis. So we're not time bound by calendar events. Uh, one of the biggest barriers to uh, bias to action I find is the calendar. So we have a meeting. It's great. Now we got to get something done and we go like, okay, when should we get together next? Well, when's the next time we have open on your calendar? And then like, it's a horrible way to be doing yeah. that. And it's like 20 minutes of back and forth. No, right. not that day, but maybe the next day. No, not that one for Bob. Like it's yeah. horrible. Versus saying, what is the work to be done? What is the job to be done? And like, who's going to do it? How long is it going to take? When do you need the review? And do you need to have a meeting to do all of that? You may or may not. Uh, I, I am a big proponent of meeting hygiene that says only have meetings when you absolutely need yeah. to have them. Right. I, uh, I have, and, and the other thing I found with meetings is they don't need to be 60 minutes or 90 minutes most of the time. Oftentimes they can be 30 or even 18 minutes, which is really our actual attention span anyway, we'll fill the time that we have. So I think oftentimes too, we'll get more time back by not trying to make these belabored long meetings and actually being more prepared when we get to the meeting versus trying to kind of hash out the information that we could have read beforehand. Yeah, I, I still believe in um, using meeting time for decision times, to, mm. for, for, um, not for information sharing. If you could have read the PowerPoint beforehand, send it out and expect that people will have read it. Um, it, it, again, having a PowerPoint read to me is like the worst experience. Oh, possible. the worst. <laughs> it's like, I'm just going to take a nap in the corner. I'll see you later. <laughs> yeah. When I do briefings with companies, for example, I ask them to send me the deck ahead of time and they're very reluctant because they want me to want to walk me through the deck. Yes. Like, yes. Oh, it, it is. I don't know if you experienced this earlier, but I always, um, before, well, before the podcast, right, we got information from you so that I could do research and be prepared versus asking you the naive questions on the, on the podcast, but off almost every time, actually every time when I have a meeting coming, I say to them, please send me anything ahead of time that you think would be of value for me to, you know, learn or read prior so I can come prepared and we can use our time wisely. And I'd say maybe 5% of the time people send something back. And to your point, they want to walk me through something. And I just keep thinking, yes, but I would be able to ask better questions 
and use both our time more wisely if I could just see that ahead of time. Yeah, that sense of control that people need to have, right? Um, I, I keep going back to um, meeting really good meetings are, it's not, it's not a rocket science here. This is pretty yeah. obvious. Have an agenda, set materials in advance, be very clear what the outcome is. Um, invite only the people who are going to be needed on the team on, on that on that call. If they're not going to contribute, don't invite them. And this is my rule with my team is if there's a meeting where you don't feel you need to be there, you have the power, you have the permission. In fact, we expect you to exercise the power of two feet and walk out because you don't need to be there. <laughs> right. Sleep. I'd much rather you walked out than I wasted your time because there's probably something else I need you to do. So, yeah, but I I really like what you said, and I want us all to pay attention that meeting time is decision time. Um, And I I think I love how you frame that. And, you know, for for me, it's either decision time or I I need help. Like, I, I need, I have a challenge and I need other people's minds on it together for some reason. But whatever it is, it's it should be something that moves the needle forward, not something that's just a sharing of information. I think that there's a, a big difference between information and insights, and we often get bogged down in information. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, the, um, I look at it this way. If you could actually see the cost of meetings, like how much oh, money, Billions of dollars, right? Yeah, and, and it's just like, this is the cost of the meeting. Is it worth it? Mm, Are that's you a very think of it. It's a very scarce resource. We, we oftentimes, and especially in the, in the professional ranks, think that the calendar and the time of people is, it, it, you know, it's constantly expandable. Yeah, we can work 50 hours, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. We can just keep adding more hours. No, you can't. There is a cost to that. People, it's really hard to get really good work out of people after 50 hours. Really hard. You're just, you're just tired. You're not yeah. focused. Yeah. You're not bringing your best to the table. Well, we have and, limited and, energy, it turns out. Exactly. What a surprise, right? I know. <laughs> And so one of the things I do with my team is I set deadlines for Fridays at five o'clock. I don't set deadlines at Monday at nine o'clock. <laughs> you have your weekend for, I mean, it's just a super simple thing. I, but I'm, my expectation is that you're not working over the weekend. I only laugh because I can't tell you the number of times that would happen. And I would always say to myself, well, I'm going to get it done Friday and I'm going to get it done well. I'm not just going to get it done to get it done, whatever it was. But I don't want to work over the weekend. And let's face it, a Monday morning deadline really means I'm doing it Sunday. So that doesn't make any sense. I've never understood why people do that. So I'm glad you brought that up. And, and that's a great transition, transition into my next question, which is kind of, we've been talking at the company team level, which is awesome. And I'm curious from your perspective, what you see that stops individuals from growing and disrupting at, at the personal individual level? Yeah, this is the, when I talk about disruption and growth, this is the big G. You know, this is the personal level of growth. Yeah. And I think part of it is we get into a comfort zone and it's really nice to be there. You know, it's warm and fuzzy and I don't have to think about it and stress about it. It's just comfortable. I can just do my job and do other things. And here's the thing is I I can totally get that. I hope that you're disrupting yourself in other areas and growing other areas of your life. So again, I'll, I'll give one example. A huge area of growth for many people's lives is when they start families. Hugely intense level of growth because you have this screaming baby on your side. Like, what do I do with it? It doesn't come with an instruction manual. So the learning that comes from that um, is, is just incredible. So I think the thing that stops people from um, innovating further is just they're exhausted. Mm-hmm. They haven't given themselves the time to recover. And this is the thing, when you think about an athlete training, when you're training, you have to, just as important as the time when you're training and pushing your body to new limits, just as important as the recovery time. Do we give ourselves recovery time? Do we give ourselves permission to say, okay, I'm going to sit in my comfort zone for a little while, but then just as importantly, what is the next goal I'm going to hit? Where am I going to grow? How am I going to continue to disrupt myself? You, know, you make a really important point. I hadn't really thought of it that way because ultimately when we're exhausted, we do what's easiest. It's why we eat crappy food when we're exhausted because we're like, whatever, just like give me whatever's in the fridge. I don't even care, right? When we're exhausted, we don't take the time or the, we don't have the energy, frankly, to push forward and to try things that are going to be challenging or change how we do things. It's, you're absolutely right. And I hope that we all think about this, especially because you and I are recording right before 
the holiday. So what a great example. It's like, we're going to get this done and then we're going to go take a break, hopefully. Um, yeah, I've got some chocolate chip cookies in the fridge. I, yeah. tonight, you know? <laughs> I might have had one too many last night. But um, So before I ask you the last question, where can people go to learn more and connect with you? They can go to my website, charlinglee.com. I am on every single possible uh, social platform at Charling Lee. The exception is Facebook, where it's Charling Lee author. Long story behind that one. Um, and I, I really do mean that. I, I would love to connect with people. I think the place where it makes the most sense for most people to connect is LinkedIn, just because it's, it's um, a great platform for that kind of professional connection. Uh, but I hope that we connect, you know, please reach out to me. I, I share this information. Almost nobody does. It's kind of shocking. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, I, I really do share this information. I do want to connect with people. Awesome. What's your final piece of advice for those of us on Mont Street trying to disrupt and grow? I have um, a mug that I drink out of every morning that says life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And so I, I would encourage you to find ways to move out your comf- out of your comfort zone every single day. And, and that could be in small levels. It could be at personal levels. So, for example, one of the things I, I've been doing is to see every person I come across, um, bus drivers, a homeless person on the street, the cashier at the Safeway, uh, to see every single person as a unique person that I can learn from, every single person I can learn from. That's hard. That's really hard to do. And that moves me out of my comfort zone to reach out and talk to people, to connect with people who I normally wouldn't. That is a great piece of advice to end on, particularly as, as I've mentioned, we're recording this right before the holiday and it's probably going to air after, but I think that's a great piece of advice, even just going into the weekend, you know, just remembering like, Hey, I'm going to interact with all these different people and I'm going to I'm going to learn a little something along the way. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for all the great insights on this podcast. This was, this was great. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Launch Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Launch Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LaunchStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.